Hey, listen, what's up, Camp Collide? How y'all doing tonight? Yo, I am super excited. I'm Red Bull revved up tonight. Y'all got some energy in here. Y'all got a lot of energy tonight? <laughs> y'all got energy, and I'm gonna tell you what, I'm a preacher who likes to preach with energy, so y'all gonna, y'all gonna get me going tonight. Let me, let me say a couple things real quick. So my name is Robert White, uh, and I'm excited to be your camp pastor uh, for this week. Uh, as they said before, I do a lot of camps. And so some camps you can go to, and uh, they will sit there and look at you like you just are, you know, saying something or saying nothing, or they're alive or they're asleep or whatever the case is. Tonight, I- I'm-, I'm asking you, like, go ahead and keep that same energy tonight, like that energy we had in the game, that energy we had in worship, that energy we had for uh, for being out and getting here, you can keep that same energy with the word. If you hear something that resonates with you, you can do that little whoop, whoop, you can do that right there. Uh, If you hear something that that like, it might hurt you a little bit, you're like, oh, I need to get that right. You can say, ouch, oh, that hurt, he's stepping on my toes. Uh, If you hear something that that, that you think like is for your neighbor, don't tell him right now, like pull him to the side later and be like, yo, you know he was talking to you, right? Uh, you, you You can keep that same energy in here. Look, I'm super excited. Uh, to be able to preach and teach with y'all this week. Uh, I really want to take you on a journey over these next few days. I, w- I want to take you on a journey. And, and I'm, I'm grateful that I get to do it in a camp setting. One of the reasons why I love doing camps, honestly, y'all, is because at a camp, like I'm a pastor of a church too, so I preach every weekend. I'm preaching to people every weekend. And I, and I create series and I preach in series. Y'all's pastors probably preach in series. And I preach in a series and I usually have to tell them like, hey, you should come back next week for the next part of the series. I don't have to do that with y'all. Y'all got to come back. So I'm good. <laughs> I don't have to do that. So, so tonight I want to start this journey uh, with you, and uh, we're going to go somewhere this week, and I pray that the Lord will work on you as he's been working on me. And so the first night tonight, I want to do a little bit of a heart check. I want to do a little bit of a heart check. If you were turning your Bibles, now here's another thing. I love my Bible, okay? So, so when we turn in our Bibles, I want y'all to get excited. When I tell you where are we going in the scripture, get excited because guess what? When the Bible is open, God's mouth is open. God is speaking straight to you. Amen? All right, here we go. Turn to Proverbs chapter number four. That's right. Proverbs chapter number four. Proverbs chapter number four. And I'm only going to read one verse tonight, but to unpack this verse, we got a lot of stuff that we can give you. So I'm only going to read one verse, Proverbs chapter number four. And the verse that we're going to read is verse 23. Proverbs chapter number four, verse 23. If you know anything about the Proverbs, right, many of them are written by a guy by the name of Solomon, who we believe to be the wisest man to ever live. When, when he, the son of King David, was taken over Israel as king, he got to God and he, he, he woke up one night and God said, ask me for whatever you want. He said, ask me for whatever you want. Now, I don't know about you, I would have got my list out. I would have pulled up my notes app in my phone, and all of my wish lists would have been up. And I'd have been, okay, God, here we go. Uh, I've been wanting this house over here. I've been wanting this car right here. I've been needing uh, this, this, this person uh, to get right in my life. I've been wanting all these things. He said, ask me for whatever you want. And when Solomon got a chance to get in front of God and ask him for, or, or to ask whatever he wanted from God, here's what he said. He said, God, I'm young. He said, God, I'm young, and and I have influence over a whole lot of people. He says, what I really need more than anything is wisdom. He said, ask me for whatever you want. I mean, I want you to take a second and begin to think, like, what is it that you would ask for before you heard this story? What is it that you would actually ask for if God actually came to you and said, get, ask me for whatever you want? Solomon says, I'm young, and I got, a, I got influence over a lot of people. I need wisdom to know how to go in and out before them and lead them in the right way. The reason why I want to take you on a journey is because I'm looking at a group of over 1,000 Solomons. I'm looking at a group of over 1,000 Solomons who God has given influence to. 
that you have leadership in you. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, you are a leader. And God has called you to lead, whether it's on your campus, whether it's with your friends, whether it's at your church, whether it's in your family. Some of you are going to be called to lead your parents to Christ. The reality is you are called to be a generation that is to shift this culture who is trying to turn its back on God to revival. This is a culture that has leadership all over it. And tonight, I believe God is asking at the opening part of Camp Collide, hey, what do you want from me? You, you come into camp, and as we just heard, as the break, 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 was, breakaway was telling us, they were saying, hey, listen, you come to camp, and it's not like church. There's a different level of anticipation here. There's a different level of expectation here. God has met us on these holy grounds, and I think he's asking a question. What do you want? Can I prove to you just a little bit more from this Solomon story? You know, right before God says, what do you want from me? Solomon had offered up a thousand sacrifices. <laughs> and I see your lives, like lives that could be anywhere else this week. As a matter of fact, on Sunday, you have chosen to spend your Father's Day Worshiping the Father? I see a thousand sacrifices in the room. I see a thousand people saying, I'm offering up my life to God. Here's, here's why I'm bringing this up. Because a thousand sacrifices, you know what that means? You know what that means? That means that God is coming to you like he came to Solomon. He's saying, ask me for what you want. And I'm going to share with you what Solomon said. He said, give me wisdom. I got leadership over a lot of people, and I need wisdom. So, so when we go to Proverbs chapter number four, we're reading the words of one of the wisest men to ever live who asked God that when he asked him whatever he wanted, he says, give me wisdom. So when we read this verse, I don't want you to read it just as some command. I don't want you to read it as just some good advice. This is the wisdom that God granted to Solomon. God told Solomon, just because you asked me for wisdom, here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you wisdom, and then I'm going to give you your enemies, and then I'm going to give you prosperity, and I'm going to give you life long. He said, I'm going to give you everything that you didn't ask for because wisdom brings all of those things. So God says tonight, ask what you want. I'm telling you the answer. The right answer is ask God for wisdom. Let's expect wisdom. I want to show you how we get it in this particular text. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. One verse, simple but deep. Keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flow the springs of life. One translation says, the New International Version says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Say that again. Above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Solomon knows something that we don't know, but we will know by the end of the night. Your heart is important. Your heart is important. The first successful open heart surgery was performed by a man by the name of Dr. Daniel Hale Williams in 1893. It was the first successful open heart surgery. Now, the, the reason why this is important is because during open heart surgery, the heart is stopped and a bypass machine is used to keep the patient alive until the heart is fixed. The heart is stopped during open heart surgery. And the reason why open heart surgery was such a big deal is because that heart was so damaged that it needed to be stopped in order to be fixed. But in open heart surgery, if you stop the heart, the life stops. And so there were people who were trying to figure out how do we keep the person alive? The heart is fixable, but when the heart stops, life stops. How do we keep them alive? When the heart stops, it's over. They said there's this bypass machine that'll keep the heart alive and keep the person alive, rather, while the heart is being fixed. And tonight, what I want to do is there's some damaged hearts in the room. There's some damaged hearts in our lives. And the word of God is going to keep us alive while God works on our heart. Without a functioning heart, y'all, we can't live. Without a functioning, healthy heart, we can't live. We can say we want to live for Jesus. We can say we want to live purpose-filled lives. We can say we want to be successful. But without a functioning, healthy heart, life is impossible. 
And the reason why we see so much of the damage that's going on in our culture and our society is because we have people running around with damaged, unhealthy hearts. But there is hope for your heart, and it's found in the Scripture. And the Bible teaches us in Proverbs 4 and 23 what we ought to be doing with our hearts. Physically, in our country, we've got people with some serious heart problems. Physically, physically, people have heart problems. Now, the problem with getting old, I'm getting older, I'm getting older. And so the problem with getting older is you start looking up old people problems. You start looking up old people problems. I start looking up like, hey, man, when I turn this age, what are the symptoms of getting older with this age? And you start realizing that, that people, like, got real heart issues. And just a couple of years ago, I went on this journey to start losing weight because as I'm getting older, I start realizing when that, when that, when that virus that shall, name, shall remain uh, nameless in this room, when it start hitting, one of the things they said was people who are obese are at large for, for, uh, for morbidity with that disease that shall remain nameless in this room. And I said to myself, oh, man. I got to start losing some weight. So I started losing weight. Then when I started losing weight, I started saying, okay, how do I extend my lifespan? And then I realized that there was some, some, some stuff that came along with it, right? I'm a researcher. I started Googling, uh, what, how do I extend my lifespan? And it was like, the number one killer of Americans. I was like, I didn't ask for what kills me. I need to know how to live longer. <laughs> it's like the number one killer of Americans is heart disease. And most Americans have heart disease. And that's the number one cause of death. Now, y'all are like, I'm young. I'm not thinking about no heart disease. Stop bringing up that doom and gloomy here, Robert. But I noticed that this is what most people in our country are suffering from. And so I started looking up, what foods can help my heart? I can start eating leafy greens, and I started having salads for breakfast even. I was like, you know what, we have dessert for breakfast in our country. We just put an egg on and a bunch of sugar on it and eat it. And I started saying, I got I to gotta start eating better. I started working out more because I wanted a healthier heart. And what I learned about a healthy heart is that the primary function of the heart, watch this, is to circulate the blood through the body. The primary purpose of the heart is to circulate the blood through the body. The healthy heart was a means to an end. Let me say that again. The healthy heart is a means to an end. Dr. Tony Evans says that everything natural is a reflection of everything spiritual. If the heart physically is to purpose, if the purpose of the heart physically is to get blood throughout the body, I believe that the heart spiritually is to get the blood to the world. That it, is, it is the heart of the Christian that is to get the blood of Jesus, this great testimony of how it is that Christ has saved the world through his sacrificial death to all of the world. But if we don't have healthy hearts, the blood can't circulate. If we don't have healthy hearts, the blood is blocked. If we don't have healthy hearts, then what happens is Jesus' work through us on earth is hindered. His work was effective, but ours is affected. Here's what he says. He says, what I need to do is have open heart surgery on the believer. And if I can get their hearts healthy, I can get the blood to another area. When I, if I can get their hearts healthy, I can get the blood to racial reconciliation. If I can get the blood healthy, I can get the blood to gender confusion. If I can get the blood, if I can get the heart healthy, I can get the blood to political uh, uh, drama. If I can get the blood healthy, I can get the blood, I mean, if I get the heart healthy, I can get the blood to depression and anxiety. If I can get the heart healthy, I can get the blood to every situation that needs healing. Jesus promises healing through his blood. And here's what we want. We want to make sure that we have healthy hearts. When the Bible describes the heart, it's not talking about your physical heart. The Bible is describing the place of your control center of your life. The heart is the core of your intellectual, your emotional, your relational, your volitional, and your moral self. Denying our hearts, denying our hearts care and attention that it needs will eventually lead us into a dark and a lonely place. Have you ever been in a situation where everything around you was okay, but something inside of you wasn't okay? Like, you don't have to nod your head today because I know that's something that we don't like to share with other people. We like for everybody to think everything is okay all the time. But the truth of the matter is there are moments in our lives where we have a moment where everything around me seems to be flowing just right. Everything around me seems to be going just fine. But something on the inside of me is not sitting well. Can I suggest to you that it may be a heart issue? Can I suggest to you that something has attacked your heart and what you need is the surgeon to come and fix you from the heart attack? People are dying spiritually because their hearts are damaged. 
Just like the physical heart is responsible for getting blood to the rest of the body, our spiritual hearts make it possible for the blood of Jesus to do his work in our lives. Proverbs 4.23 gives us this one key thought. You all are living a heart-shaped life. You, you all are living a heart-shaped life. That's right. When you look at your life, it is a reflection of your heart. When you look at your life, you are seeing what's going on with your heart. Above all else, guard your heart because out of it flows the issues of life. You want to see what's going on in your life? Check at your heart. So how, how do we test the heart? One of the things that I, I said when I get old, when, as you get old, you start checking out old people's stuff. So I said, how do I know if I have a healthy heart? And I'm one of those people, uh, uh, don't, don't come at me, anybody who has like uh, something to say about this because I know I should be going to the doctor more. I'm one of those people that when I need to know something, I Google it before I call my doctor. All right, I know I got some people like that in here. It's not the right thing to do, but it's what I do. I Google it first. I'm like, how do I know I got a healthy heart? So I saw one that said, hey, if you suffer from shortness of breath, you may have a heart problem. It says, well, how do I know I got shortness of breath? Can you climb four flights of steps without breathing hard? I wish we had four flights of steps. I would test y'all. I would have a race so we could redeem the guys and the girls that competition that happened earlier. <laughs> and we could climb up four. <laughs> I know guys. <laughs> I, I, I wish we had four or five steps so we could run up those steps and see if we had healthy hearts. The reality is, though, the Bible describes when God creates man in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, he says that he forms man from the dust of the ground. And on the outside, he looked really good. But until God breathed his breath into man, he was not a living soul. While we can take our physical hearts and test them by going up a flight of steps, here's the reality. There are certain challenges that we have in life that we are faced with the shortness of breath, the breath of God on the inside of us. We don't have the breath of God to stand up for righteousness. We don't have the breath of God to deal with the trauma and situations that come across us. We have heart problems. We have a shortness of breath. And as we test our hearts, we can see that we need the miraculous power of God in his Holy Spirit. So what do I want us to do? I want us to do what Solomon said. He says, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. So I'm going to give you three things that you ought to do. Three things that you're going to do tonight uh, and for the rest of your lives that are going to help you to make sure you got a healthy heart. If you're ready for them, say, let's go. All right, here it is. Point number one, write it down if you're taking notes. And if you're not taking notes, write it down. Here we go. One, prioritize your heart. Prioritize your heart. The Bible says above all else. Above all else. You need to prioritize your heart. You need to prioritize your volitional, emotional, relational, moral self. You need to prioritize your heart. It's how you think. It's the center of how you, how you live. You need to prioritize it. Let me tell you something. I got a friend who she says this often. She says, if it ain't written, it ain't real. And her biggest thing is, if it's not written, it's not a priority. If it's not a priority, it's not going to get done. And I'm going to tell you the truth. If I don't prioritize something in my life, it is not getting done. Like seriously, if I don't get up and take care of certain things by 2 o'clock, like literally 2 o'clock in the afternoon, most people say, I work 9 to 5. Listen, those last three hours are literally me just being around. I'm just alive. Like, I work 9 to 5. No, that's not it. I wake up in the morning. I wake up early too. I wake up at 4.30 every morning. And if I don't get it done in a certain amount of time, it ain't getting done. I have what I believe is undiagnosed because all I do is Google. I don't ask the doctor. I've never asked my doctor if it's true. It's undiagnosed. But I believe I got a tad bit of ADD. And if I don't get it done in a certain amount of time, I'm looking at the birds in the afternoon. I'm like, yo, that is Awesome. I, listen, if I stare at this ceiling too long, I might find something up here, distract me and forget about the whole message. I've got to prioritize in my life. Why? Because if I don't prioritize, something else will come in and take the place. Something else less important will come in and take the place of something that needs to get done. If I don't work out first thing in the morning, something's coming up. If I don't read my Bible first thing in the morning, something's going to come up. I get up at 4.30. 4.30 to 5 is time with Jesus. 5 to 6, workout time. 6 to uh, uh, 7, get ready time. Then it's time to spend time with my kids. Like, I got priorities in the morning. Why? Because something else will always creep in. You know why I work out so early? People ask me, why do you work out so early, Robert? Why do you have to get up so early in the morning? Because nobody's calling me for counseling at 5 a.m. And if I do it at 2 in the afternoon, somebody might call me and say, hey, pastor, I got an emergency. I'm like, okay. 
I, 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 I have to prioritize things or unless something else will come in and take the place of what I know to be important. The same is true with your heart. There are certain things that you have not prioritized as far as your walk with God, your relationship with God, your heart being given to him so that he can use you the way that he wants to use you. And here's what happens. You say, I'll get around to it. You say, I'll do it tomorrow. You say, I promise, I'm going to start my devotional next week. No, you got to prioritize your heart. You got to prioritize giving God your best. And I don't mean just putting him on the list. I mean it has to be first. It can't just be on the list like, oh, okay, things I want to do in 2022. And it's always cute because it rhymes, right? Things I want to do in 2022. How I want to live in 2025. Like, oh, you want to come up with that? And you, you prioritize it, but you never do it. Or you put it on a list, but you never do it. And here's what I need you to do. I need you to prioritize your heart. The Bible makes, it, makes the heart a pretty big deal. The Bible has over 920 references of the heart in the scripture. And if I'm honest, I struggle with this. I struggle with prioritizing my heart. I give God my tasks sometimes before I give him my heart. I give God my duty sometimes before I give him my heart. And as we look at this, this is the reason why. Sometimes it's uncomfortable to give God the heart because the heart is where deep transformational change happens. That because when I give God my heart, sometimes he's not going to point to somebody else that needs to change. He's going to show me I do. When I give God my heart, sometimes he's not going to tell me how they were wrong. Sometimes he's going to tell me how I need to forgive. When I give God my heart, sometimes he's not going to tell me what I need to say to clap back. Sometimes he's going to tell me how to shut my mouth. The reality is when I prioritize my heart, deep transformational change begins to happen. When I begin to prioritize my heart, my prayers start to change. When I begin to prioritize my heart, my worship starts to change. When I begin to prioritize my heart, my attitude starts to change. Prioritizing your heart is some crazy serious stuff because God will begin to deeply transform you. Listen. We've got people in the room who can prove that your heart is a pretty big deal. And because you haven't given it to God, you're dealing with issues that you know you want to get rid of. But that deep priority has not been uh, something that you've, that you've put forth. And here's what God is saying today. Every broken heart, every bitter heart, every angry heart, every arrogant heart, every joyful heart, every generous heart needs to prioritize being in a relationship with Jesus so that he can elevate that heart to the place to where it looks more like him. Jesus wants to take your heart and he wants to do something with it for the glory of God. The first thing you got to do is you got to prioritize your heart. Second thing you got to do is you got to protect your heart. You got to protect your heart. Above all else, prioritize your heart. Guard your heart. Protect your heart. Now I know there are some people in here who are guarded. And this word right here makes you say, oh yeah, I've been guarding my heart. Because I got hurt. Maybe you got hurt by a parent. Maybe you friend hurt you, maybe you've been rejected, maybe you feel a sense of you can't trust anybody, you've been around some disloyal people, and you're saying to yourself, I already guard my heart, Robert. I'm not talking about bitterness. I'm talking about protecting your heart against the things that the enemy wants to, wants to put in it. I'm talking about protecting your heart from things that the culture wants to seep in there and make you think that they're okay when God has told you they're not. I'm talking about guarding your heart against the subtle schemes of Satan. You need to guard your heart. If your heart is that important and without your heart you cannot live, why would you choose to live with poison in it? I'm going to say that again. If your heart is that important and you cannot live without your heart, why do you choose to live with poison in your heart? You are slowly allowing yourself to die. Spiritually, we're dying because we're allowing poison in our hearts. Poison from the culture that tells us that God, what he said is not true. It's the very first lie that Satan told to Eve, and it's the same lie he's been telling to us. Did God really say? And we've been eating from that fruit since the beginning of time, questioning God, thinking that we have a better way than him, knowing good and evil without him telling us what is good and shunning us from what is evil. The problem is we've got poison in our hearts. When the enemy spoke to Eve that day, he planted poison in her heart. Here's the reality. Both God and the devil want your heart because they both know whoever controls your heart controls your life. Both God, ah, 
Uh, it's quiet. Here's why I love that pin drop silence. You know why? Because in this age, Varna did a study recently that said most of us don't even believe anymore in a literal devil. And I need you to understand that he is very real. And the truth of the matter is, he wants your heart. God wants your heart, but so does the enemy. We have an enemy who wants your heart because both of them know that whoever controls your heart controls your life. And God is the ultimate gentleman. He will never force himself on you. He gives you the right to choose whether or not you will give him your heart. God is the ultimate gentleman who has a plan for your life, and so does the enemy. But God says, I'm going to present my plan through the process of salvation through Jesus Christ. And when I present my plan, I need you to choose it. The enemy also has a plan for you. The enemy also has uh, a desire for your heart. In John chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says the thief comes, the enemy comes, Satan comes, the destroyer comes, the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to place poison in your heart to steal your identity, to kill your purpose, to destroy your destiny. But God says, Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Two plans sit before you, one to destroy you and one to give you life. You've got to learn to protect your heart from the poison of the enemy. How do you protect your heart from the poison of the enemy? You begin to be vigilant. You begin to watch. You begin to see in the ESV, it said, keep your heart with all vigilance. That means you got to get on a, you got to have your head on a swivel. You got to be looking for what doesn't look like God. The enemy wears a different uniform. How many of y'all play sports? Anybody play sports in here? All right, keep your hand up. All my football players, all my football players. All right, let me tell y'all a football story real quick. When I was in the ninth grade, uh, I was on the field, and I'm from Long Beach, California. That'll be relevant in just a minute. But we were playing against Compton. Compton, they were always terrible in football. But if you know anything about Compton historically, they are thugs in Compton. So here's what happens, right? They're going to lose the game, but they're going to get a big hit in somewhere. They're going to get a big hit in somewhere. One day, I became the victim of the big hit. I became the victim of the big hit. I'm going on the field, and I'm getting down on my offensive lineman, and we get in the stands, and we're ready to go. And I put my hand down, and I start blocking my guy. I look back. My quarterback is back there. One of the defensive linemen is broken free. He hits my quarterback's arm. The ball is flailing. I know for a fact, listen, that ball has been tipped. It's a fair game. So I'm saying to myself, I'm getting ready to catch that ball and run. It's an offensive lineman's drink. So what happens is I look at that ball. It's up in the air. I run underneath the ball. I got my eyes on the ball, but I didn't have my head on a swivel. My guy comes up from Compton. All I saw was blue. Blue coming at my face. I turned this way, and he blew me off my feet. That night, I was dizzy for three days. He took me out. You know why? Because I wasn't vigilant. I was so excited about what it is that I could grab out of the air that I didn't pay attention to the enemy that was around me. And I'm telling you, there are some of us who are so excited about what we think is a blessing that we're missing. The enemy setting us up for the big hit. The enemy is setting you up for the big hit. Oh, it's this, it's this relationship that's up in the air that I'm looking at, looking and looking, and the enemy comes. Big blue helmet ready to take you out. Oh, the, this is the popular thing on social media now, and this is the, the direction that I'm going. Big blue helmet getting ready to take you out. You got to keep your head on a swivel. You got to keep looking for, to see where your enemy is. He's looking to give you the big hit. He knows he's defeated. I told you the Compton players knew they would always lose the game, but they were looking for the big hit. They wanted to take out one of our players. Here's the reality. The enemy knows he's defeated. Jesus defeated him with nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head, and a spear through his side. When his blood spilled out, he went into that grave but came out on the third day. He defeated Satan. Come here, though. But the game ain't over. We're up by a whole lot. We've got victory. I got, I, got, I got DVR, so I watch the end of the game. I see that we win. The problem is I'm in the middle of this thing. I saw it at the end. We win. He's still looking for the big hit, though. And you've got to pay attention to what he's doing. You've got to guard your heart. I'll give you some practical tips on that in just a little bit. But I need you to understand Satan wants to deal a death blow to your heart while God wants to empower your heart for life. 
what, what do I need to do then? What do I need to do? I told you I'm from Long Beach, California, and I grew up in, 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 in a bit of a different environment than the suburbs of Texas. I grew up where there was gangs. I grew up listening to Snoop Dogg and NWA. Don't listen to that. It's not good for you. <laughs> I, 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 grew up, I grew up in a place where there was, there was gangsters and thugs and all of these things. So when I moved to Texas, I got soft. Like, like, I got soft. My wife grew up in Southern California as well, but she kept her edge, y'all. If you meet my wife, like, she's a sweet, soft-spoken. Some of the people here who know my wife, they'll say, no, not Marisha. Why? No, you can't be describing her. Oh, no, this is her. For real, she got a little hood in her, y'all. And so what happens is everywhere we go, when we hop out the car, we can be, we can be on somebody's remote farm. And they got 200 acres. And we walk away from the car. My wife will look at me with that, with that hood in the back of her mind because somebody's always trying to carjack you. That's maybe that's a hood mentality. She looks at me and says, did you lock the door? And I say, no, why would I need to lock the door? She says, you never know who's trying to steal from us. And I'm like, hey, we're on a farm with 300 acres. There's nobody out here but us. Everywhere we get out, we get out at the mall. Did you lock the door? We get out of a friend's house. Did you lock the door? I pull up in the garage. Did you lock the door? My wife wants me to lock the doors at all times. The only time she doesn't ask me to lock the doors is when we pull up to a restaurant or we pull up to an event and we get valet parking. When we get valet parking, my wife doesn't ask me to lock the doors because I no longer am in control. I hand the keys over to the valet and they become responsible. But you know what my wife doesn't do? She doesn't come out the restaurant after the valet is parked, go back to the stand and say, excuse me, Mr. Valet, did you lock the door?" My wife doesn't do that. You know why? Because she trusts the hands of the one we place the keys. Can I talk to somebody? That the best way for you to protect your heart is to give it away. Because you're holding your heart in your hands and you're waiting to see if Satan's going to come and steal it. So you can't lift your hands in praise because you got to grip your heart. You can't lift your hands in service because you got to grip your heart. But what if you gave your heart to Jesus completely and you give him the keys to your life and you walk away and say, Mr. Valet, you got the car. I'm going to go enjoy my life. The best way for you to guard your heart is for you to give your heart. Watch. I need you to get this. The best way for you to guard your heart is for you to give your heart. That's, that's for you to protect your heart. First thing we talked about was prioritizing your heart. Second thing we talked about was protecting your heart. The last thing we'll talk about tonight, and I want you to understand this, you need to position your heart. You need to position your heart. Watch what the Bible says. Above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life, which means if my heart is the central piece for where the issues of life are flowing, I need to put my heart in a position to where it can flow out the things that God wants for it to have. I need to put my heart in a position so that when it flow, what flows out of it comes out of it, it looks like him and not like me. I need to position my heart in such a way that, that, that it makes sense to the world that Christ actually has my heart. If your heart is not in the right position, what happens is the world starts to see you. Can, can I be honest? One of the things that's happening in Christianity today is that people are seeing a whole lot of us and not a whole lot of him. Jesus is irresistible. I'm going to say that again. Jesus is irresistible. You know how I know? I read my Bible. I read my Bible, and when I read my Bible, here's what I do know. I know that Jesus got killed, not because the majority of the people didn't like him, but because the religious people didn't like him. I, I read my Bible, and I realize Jesus dies because he's upsetting a social and religious order that people had held on to for traditions and years and things that they didn't even fully understand. But when Jesus would walk into places and heal somebody, the world would look and say, whoa, this guy. I don't get it twisted. The world will always be fickle if they don't fully understand what it is that they're following. So they will follow Jesus, but because they'd be fickle because they didn't understand who they were following. They thought they were going to be following a triumphant king on a throne. He wanted to be a suffering servant on a cross. And here's what happens. So the world turns on him. But when Jesus walked the earth and did what he did, here's the reality. You couldn't keep a crowd from Jesus. You couldn't keep people from showing up. He feeds 5,000 people on one occasion and 4,000 on the next. And that was after teaching for hours. If I go a minute over 45 minutes, y'all going to start dozing off. Jesus was irresistible. 
the church today is very resistant because we've put in a whole bunch of us and have left out a whole bunch of him. We got to reposition our hearts. Jesus is calling us this week to reposition our hearts, to put ourselves back in position where we know who we are in him so that out of us flow the issues of life. People with anxiety and depression should see the healing power of Jesus flowing out of us. People who are dealing with issues of identity should see the, the uh, identifying power of Jesus flowing through us. People who feel lonely and rejected should feel the love of Jesus flowing from us. It says out of it flow the issues of life. Not only can I tell what's going on in my life, watch this, by what's flowing out of my life, but I can tell what, where I'm positioned as a Christian by what's happening in society. When Christians align with Jesus, revival begins to happen. When Christians align with Jesus, revival begins to happen. Y'all don't, don't take my word for it. Go do some research. Go understand that every revival that's ever taken place in history has, become, has been because a group of believers got together, repented of their own sins, said, God, we want to look like you. We'll just pray until you show up. And then Jesus started doing crazy stuff by the power of the Holy Spirit, and revival happened. It happened at Pentecost. It happened in the first and second great awakening. It's happened throughout all of human history. When believers start deciding they're going to look like Jesus and not like denomination, when Jesus, when people start deciding they're going to look like Jesus and not tradition, when people start deciding they're going to look like Jesus and not political parties, when people start identifying strictly with Jesus and not their ethnicity, revival breaks out. It's inevitable. It's promised. It's the gospel. Here's what we need to do. The Bible says, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Here's the reality. we got to position our hearts. But before you can position your heart, you need to look and see what's the state of your heart. And what they do in the hospitals, when they want to check on a heart, old people stuff, I, I researched it. Here it is. They give you what's called an angiogram. And an angiogram is a picture of your heart that they put up on the screen. So they take the picture and they post it and they show you what's going on in your heart. Say, here's Mr. White. No, nope, I'm not going to use my name. Mr. Johnson. Hope there's no Johnson in here. <laughs> here you go, Mr. Johnson. There's a couple of blockages here. And here's where we're going to have to go in and do the bypass and blah, blah, blah. Based on the picture that's posted, they can actually see what's going on in the heart. I thought about that and I said, here's what most of us do in our lives today. We don't have an angiogram, but all of us have an Instagram. And the way that we live with our Instagram, you know what people do. Mainly they wake up in the morning, it's been said, studies uh, across the world have happened now that people, the first thing they grab when they wake up in the morning, not their glasses, not a toothbrush, you know you got that morning breath. And you don't go for your toothbrush. The first thing you go for is that cell phone. Why do you go for the cell phone? Because you want to see what's happening in the world. You want to see who liked what you posted. We take pictures and post them to express and expose our hearts. I, I can tell by your IG, your Instagram, what your heart says. Can I ask you today, Christians, believers, those who know Jesus, can you begin to check your AG, your angiogram, your spiritual angiogram? We need to adopt a new term. I got to check my AG in the morning. I need to wake up and check my AG and say, God, post a picture that exposes my heart this morning. What do I need to do today to look more like you? I want every student in this room for the rest of this week at least building a habit of checking your AG. When you wake up to do your quiet time, say to yourself, God, show me my AG. When you read your scripture, see a picture of Jesus that's, expo that's exposing what you are and are not like him. And you say to him, check my AG, God, and post for me to show me what it is that I need to do to change. Reach for your AG in the morning and say, God, I want a picture of my heart so that I can look more like you. Be like David who said, create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a steadfast or a right spirit within me. Here's what I need for you to do. Check your AG every morning. 
I need for you to check your AG. And when you check your AG, here's what I want you to do. Because there's some very practical things, even in the book of, of Proverbs, chapter, 20, verse, chapter 4, verse 23, in 24 and 25, he gives us a couple of practical things to explain how you position your heart. How do you check your AG? Here's what he says in verse 24. Put away from you crooked speech. You need to check what you say. How, how do I know that my AG has an algorithm that's messed up? I check what I say. If I'm speaking hate, if I'm speaking doom and gloom, if I'm speaking the things that, that are not incongruent with the, congruent with the word of God, if I'm speaking things that don't look like him, if I am speaking things that, that go against what it is that he said, then my AG algorithm is off. It says, keep your heart with all visions, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. You shouldn't be gossiping. You shouldn't be putting your mouth on people speaking negatively to them or angry or mean uh, uh, speech to people. You shouldn't have vile or perverse language coming out of your mouth. Here's what he also says. He says, let your eyes look directly forward. Check what you see. Let your eyes uh, put, let your eyes look directly forward. The Bible says in Hebrews, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. How do you check your AG in the morning? The thing that you snap your picture of is what you post. And you need to be snapping a picture of Jesus so that he is your example. Post that on your wall of your life so that you can see what it is that you're moving towards. Check what you say. Check what you see. And check what you seek. Check what you seek. Watch what he says. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. What are you looking for? I'm looking for Jesus to move in my life. I'm looking for him to give me gospel opportunities. I'm looking for him to give me an opportunity to look more like him. Can I, I talk to the believer. Can I talk to those who may not have a real relationship with Jesus? Sometimes your heart is so damaged, you can't do anything with the heart you have. You need a brand new one. You need a heart transplant. Yeah, there's some of you who are in the room tonight that's sitting in this room. Your heart is a ticking time bomb ready to explode. And there's nothing you can do to save it. What you need is a new heart. And Jesus says, if you will receive me as your Lord and as your Savior, I will give you a brand new heart. He says, I will give you a brand new heart. What does that mean? It means that the blood that comes to bring healing, he wants it to flow through you. But you can't get the heart unless you exchange your old one. That old heart that's full of bitterness, that old heart that's full of anxiety, that old heart that's full of fear. He says, I want you to have confidence. I want you to have confidence in the fact that you have assurance of salvation, that when this life is over, you've got a home in heaven, a place not made with hands, but that is eternal. The God says, I want you to have this resting place. I want you to have assurance that those sins that you've committed that you think are too bad for anybody to forgive, I forgive them. The Lord is saying that to you today. He says, my blood covers it, but you need a new heart so that that blood can flow to every area of your life. You can't guard what you don't have. You need a new heart. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus and you have not given your heart to him, I'm not talking about being in camp or being in church, you can be in a hospital with a dying heart. But what I want you to do tonight is I want you to ask yourself, have I truly given my life to Jesus? And tonight I want you to give it to him. Say, God, I want you to have this heart. And I want you to give me my new heart. A heart not made of stone, but made of flesh that can beat inside of me for you and you alone. I'm going to pray. And tonight I got a challenge for two people. For, for the believer, I need you to build a moat around your heart. I need you to build a moat. That's simply a, 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 a body of water around the castle so that the enemy can't get to it. I need for you to say to yourself, this week, I'm going to be building a moat around my heart so that when I get home, I can build the kingdom of God and advance it the way that God wants me to because I'm not going to let the enemy have my heart anymore. Believer, you need to do business with God tonight. Say, God. I want to build a moat around my heart. I want to build protections around my heart. I want to prioritize my heart. I want to position my heart well. But for those of you who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ, tonight what I want you to do is I want you to see one of your leaders in the back of the room. And maybe you're not ready for it tonight, but throughout this week I want you to start asking yourself, is my relationship with Jesus solidified? Am I sure 
that I'm in a relationship? If you have any doubt, you need to go and talk to somebody. Why? Because you may have the right answer. You may have a full belief in Jesus and the assurance just needs to be placed in you. But you may need a real relationship with Jesus. And so tonight while we worship, I want you, if you're here and you need to make a decision, don't be embarrassed by who's looking. No, go and talk to someone about your relationship with Jesus tonight. Get it right. We're going on a journey this week. And it all starts with us having a heart check. Prioritize your heart, protect your heart, and position your heart so that Jesus can do with your heart what he's designed and created you for. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we spent in your word. We thank you for these students, God, who are eager to spend time with you and with each other this week. God, we pray that that level of eagerness, God, does not overshadow the need for them to come and give themselves fully to you, God, in a way that, that, that has them to surrender, not just to what it is that they have always done, God, but to another level of obedience to you in their lives as Christians. And then as non-believers, God, those saying, I want to be saved. I want to be rescued from sin. I want to have this new heart that Robert is talking about. God, do your work through your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.